few miles from Buffalo, New York, and just across Lake Ontario from Toronto, is a natural wonder so majestic and powerful that every year millions of visitors are left speechless with awe. The marvel in question is, of course, Niagara Falls. Tourists flock from every state in the Union, every Canadian province, and literally every nation on Earth just to see and experience it. Niagara Falls has been an icon for two centuries. For Niagara Falls to have remained iconic, remained as crowded as it is today, it has had to work very hard to constantly reinvent itself. Anything that's superlative or extraordinary like that, people want to be around it, and they want to be drawn to it, but also, and this is very important, they want to exploit it. So Niagara Falls was this wonderful falls here, and almost right from the beginning, people started to use it in various ways. The falls seems to generate a magnetism that pulls people to it, and then forever links them to this extraordinary place, to one another, and to their destinies. Niagara Falls has attracted many daredevils, some defying clouds of mist, tricky winds, and gravity itself to walk over the yawning gulf carved by the falls. Others, for reasons as diverse as the daredevils themselves, have used some device to challenge the swirling waters of the Niagara River and plunge over the falls. I think part of the lure of Niagara was that it was understood to be a very dangerous place. And there's another whole history of people going over the falls, the history of daredevils, etc. If you separate the word daredevil, it's exactly what it is. A daredevil is somebody who goes out and does a daring thing. Maybe they make it, maybe they don't. They wanted to challenge the power of the falls, you might say. So we had people on tight ropes, we had people going over in barrels, we had people trying various kinds of stunts, jumping into the falls from great heights, and all of these sorts of things. Of course, this also appealed to the carnival atmosphere at Niagara Falls. The general circus atmosphere, these people were like performers, and people came out to watch them. People are always fascinated by the Daredevil story at Niagara Falls because it's people challenging death. There's that mystique about, you know, I can beat it, I can beat it. So people are always interested in stuff like that. For visitors and daredevils alike, the danger of Niagara Falls is part of the show. Part of the reason they come to this place. Niagara Falls forms what is arguably the world's most famous and popular natural wonder. This unforgettable display of nature's raw power has inspired poets, scientists, conservationists, politicians, and countless ordinary citizens. As partners through the rest of our lives. As partners through the rest of our lives. Not to mention generations of young couples who have flocked to the falls to get married and honeymoon. But the falls has also attracted its share of fascinating and colorful characters and activities. For many, the start of the carnival atmosphere at Niagara Falls was 1827, with the last voyage of the sad ark called the Michigan. Niagara Falls became an important tourist site right at the time when the Erie Canal was completed in 1825. People could finally come pouring into Niagara Falls, and they did. The hotel owners wanted people to stay longer. They advertised in the papers, come and see a ship go over the falls loaded with wild creatures. And people came to see this, to see the Michigan go over. 
As many as 15,000 spectators looked on as the schooner loaded with animals plunged over the falls. The natural spectacle of Niagara Falls, it seemed, was no longer enough. The carnival had begun. Niagara's next great exploit featured a symbol that would become one of the fall's best known attractions. Anybody that comes to the falls usually taking the Maid of the Mist. It's one of the oldest attractions in North America. You know, it's a thrill of a lifetime. It gives a person a chance to flirt with danger. This is real. You're there, you feel the spray on your face, you know what it feels like. The Maid of the Mist is often called the longest playing thrill ride on the continent. In 1861, a Canadian firm purchased the Maid of the Mist, triggering one of the greatest, if unintended, stunts in Niagara history. Part of the deal was delivering the 72-foot steamer to Lake Ontario, and the only way to get it there was a perilous, seemingly impossible run through the Whirlpool Rapids just below Niagara Falls. Joel Robinson was a fellow that piloted one of the old Maid of the Mists, and he had to take the Maid of the Mists to Lake Ontario. But you see, you can't bring the Maid up the falls, and you can't bring the Maid down the falls. So Joel took this Maid of the Mist through the lower rapids. The trip was three miles through some of the wildest water in the world. Robinson delivered the boat as promised, but the adventure left a lasting impression. He could barely speak for weeks, and shortly after the ordeal, he retired. Though Captain Robinson and his crew were unwilling daredevils, their feat was no less heroic or amazing. Today, the danger is more illusion than reality. For thousands of visitors to Niagara Falls each year, this is about as close to being a daredevil as it gets. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Niagara Falls. Well, we're probably uh, at least 100 yards from the, the corners of the falls at any, any one time. I have quite a, a margin of safety here. It is a bit of an optical illusion how close we go. We're a lot further back than it looks, but uh, the people don't know that because the spray is so heavy, so it's, it's quite a show for them. By the early 1800s, visitors to Niagara Falls were looking for more than just the experience of seeing the falls. It all began with a young man who came here from New England and dove into the water from the top of the falls right below, before thousands of people. 22-year-old Sam Patch dove 85 feet into the churning waters. Ten days later, he repeated the stunt from a height of 130 feet. Less than a month later, he recreated his feat at the Genesee River in Rochester. Tragically, Patch drowned. Niagara's next group of daredevils would go even further. Another class of stutters here are the rope, or in some cases, wire walkers. Uh, people who walked across the gorge on a rope. I think the wire walkers are drawn to Niagara Falls because Niagara Falls is monumental. Everything about it is big, everything about it is spectacular. So it provides an excellent backdrop for high wire walker. And I think the great love of all high wire walkers is Niagara Falls. And what more spectacular view could you have? People say, what does it look like up there? I have a wonderful view from my office. Every day I step onto the wire, I go to my office. Jay Cochran is a modern day high wire walker. He carries on a tradition started by some of the greatest entertainers ever to use Niagara Falls as a stage. My fellow Canadians, I salute you. Well, of course, Niagara Falls has held a long uh, line, a long tradition of, of, of tightrope walkers and wire walkers throughout the history. It's a 
about recreating what Niagara Falls was famous for 150 years ago. It's about bringing that second era back. The first era of wire walkers began with a man who would become one of Niagara's most famous performers, Frenchman Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as the Great Blondin. In 1859, Blondin came here and set up a wire across the gorge close to the falls, and all summer long did everything possible on that wire, backwards, frontwards, crawling, cooking meals, washing clothes, you name it, the man did it that summer, and people were fascinated. And so he started something at Niagara Falls. You have to think about it in terms of nobody ever having done it before. People were stunned that you could even put a wire across in the first place, and it is an amazing engineering feat. And then to actually get on it and walk across on it was even more stunning. He was able to project himself as a kind of a superman. Blandin was not a daredevil, per se. He really wasn't a daredevil. He knew what he was doing out there on the road. He was a performer. He was not just a rope walker, he was a real showman. And an innovator, too. He came up with many different ideas of stunts to do on the road. He was a real showman and drew tremendous crowds. London's death-defying acts turned him into a superstar at Niagara Falls. But it wouldn't be long before his supremacy on the high wire would be challenged. When Blondin was performing here at Niagara in 1859, watching him was a young man in the audience who said to himself, I can do this. And so he gave himself a fancy European name, Farini, the great Farini. Farini grew up in the area near Port Hope, Ontario, in South Central Ontario. I think from the time he was born, he wanted to do exciting things. The Great Farini came in 1860. In about June or July, they actually started competing. People were perhaps, secretly at least, hoping for someone to fall, something dangerous to happen. That was part of the attraction. So all summer long in 1860, crowds were running from one to the other and back and forth and back and forth to see if one would outdo the other. Farini did just about everything Blondin did on the rope that summer of 1860. Now, Blondin didn't like this very much because this was Blondin's show. So Blondin decided that he was going to do something so extraordinary that he would knock Farini off the wire. So first he carried a man on his back across the wire. Farini got an even bigger man. Then Blondin decided to take a stove across Niagara Falls. So Farini had to do something even more extraordinary, so he went out and got himself a washing machine. Put the washing machine on his back, walked out here across Niagara Falls. When he was about halfway across, he took a rope, lowered the rope all the way down to the water with a bucket at the end, brought the water back up, and did his laundry. So throughout that summer, they continued with this competition. So you can imagine what the scene must have been like in those days. It was spectacular. Farini and Blondin parted and never spoke, never became friends. Blondin would have nothing to do with the young man. Some people claim that Farini was just as good as Blondin. Others say no. But looking back on history now, the person that is best remembered is Blondin. And the reason for that, of course, is he was the first person to do it. So I think that's why Blondin is judged to be the greater wire walker. And I think he was the greater wire walker. But Farini was a much more extraordinary personality. More than a few wire walkers would follow in the footsteps of Blondin and Farini at Niagara Falls. In 1873, Henry Bellini drew large crowds to his walks on a heavy 1,500-foot-long rope stretched near the American Falls. He combined his wire walk with a leap into the water below on a tethered rope. Not all the Niagara wire walkers were men. 
In 1876, Italian performer Signorina Maria Spelterini crossed the Niagara Gorge repeatedly on an 800-foot rope, much like the one Blondin had used. Sometimes she made the crossing blindfolded or with peach baskets strapped to her feet. In 1890, Samuel Dixon crossed the most turbulent part of the Whirlpool Rapids on a rope less than an inch thick. He laid down, stood on one foot, and hung from the rope. He is considered the last memorable tightrope walker of Niagara Falls. You might think that somebody who walks very high on a high wire, it's all about fear and scaring the audience. Audiences do come and feel that way somewhat when they come to see somebody walk on a high wire. But when it's done, they're very much inspired by it. They see a human being walking in the sky. They see a human being doing something that appears to be impossible. Walking on a high wire is to take the impossible and make it possible. And I think that's very seductive for human beings because we want to see if we can do impossible things. We want to see if we can do things that other people can't do. What I am attempting to do is carry on what they started. Not just to do what they did, because that wouldn't be accomplishing anything, but to carry it on in a bigger, much grander fashion. My goal is to come back one day and walk across the actual falls itself. It has never been done. There was never a position and never uh, facilities to be able to allow that kind of thing back then. But I will do it. The special thing about Niagara Falls is that it has a long line of tradition and history and I'm honored to be part of it. People came to Niagara Falls to perform stunts because they knew this is where people came to see something magnificent. They also came here because Niagara has this impression on people of making you want to challenge it. People, when they see something as grand and magnificent as Niagara, they want to do something there to challenge its mighty power and to make themselves as famous as the falls. There's something about Niagara Falls that just connects it to desire. If you go and stand at the very edge of Niagara Falls, there's something about it that's irresistible. There's something about it that draws you. And high wire walkers, I think, have that to an exponential degree. They're drawn to it. They're drawn to that spectacle of nature. And the desire inside them is connected to it. I think they got drawn from France or parts of Canada, the United States or wherever, to come to the falls to do what they did but then when they got here, I think there was a magic that really kind of overtook them. And everybody who saw it would be inspired and remember it for the rest of their life. If truth be told, many of those who came to see the famous wire walkers at Niagara Falls did so in hopes of witnessing a tragedy. If performers were bent on attempting such acts, the argument went, then people might as well be there to watch them fall into the water. The wire walkers never obliged. In reality, the danger was more apparent than real. A different and far more risky variety of daredevils would come to Niagara Falls in the new century. The idea was simple. Instead of dancing on a wire, these 20th century daredevils would actually take the plunge. When you go over Niagara Falls in a barrel, you're taking a great chance. You get in the barrel and nature just kind of takes you over the falls. And whatever happens, happens. I guess in the minds of local people, a daredevil, when you talk about the falls, is somebody that goes over the falls in some type of contraption, whether that be a rubber ball, a steel barrel, a ski jet, or a kayak. Sixteen people have deliberately gone over the Horseshoe Falls in something or other, including two who've done it twice. And out of the 16, 11 have survived. Some of them, of course, are hoping to make a lot of money from the stunt, but hardly any of them made any money of any consequence. 
The most famous stunts occurred at Horseshoe Falls, where daredevils would cram themselves into a floating device and be swept over the falls. But the first people to challenge Niagara's mighty power did so in the famous Whirlpool Rapids just below the falls. It's the same location where the Fenabulists, the tightrope walkers, walked across the gorge. For years, they walked on the ropes. But then people were getting tired of that. So they did something different. They started riding barrels below the falls, and boats below the falls, and swimming below the falls. Many people have gone through the lower rapids below the falls. It's the fastest flowing stretch of water in North America. It's a class five, six rapids. About 27 people went through the rapids. The challenge of going through the Whirlpool Lower Rapids was even greater in the earlier years because there was more water going through that narrow, narrow stretch of, of river. So when they challenged the Lower Rapids, they really did challenge it. In 1886, English barrel maker Carlisle Graham was the first to navigate the rapids in a barrel. He made five successful trips. Graham's friend, Maud Willard, was next to try the rapids. She made the trip in a wooden barrel accompanied by her pet fox terrier. When the barrel got caught in the rapids, Willard died in the attempt. The terrier survived. The graves of both Willard and Graham are marked at the Oakwood Cemetery in Niagara Falls, New York. Nearby, another small gravestone honors Annie Edson Taylor. It was Taylor who first elevated the daredevils of Niagara Falls to new heights. One of the most interesting uh, characters here at the falls over the years was Annie Edson Taylor, who was the very first to go over the falls in a, uh, a barrel. Uh, she was 62 years old at the time. And she was desperate to make some money so she wouldn't end up poorly in her older age. So she had an oak barrel made, and she decided to go over the Horseshoe Falls, be the first person to ever do it. She ended up doing it on her birthday, October 24th, 1901. to think some woman in her 60s getting into an oak barrel going over the Horseshoe Falls that no one had ever done before, that took a lot of courage or else she was not exactly all there. Annie Taylor had gone over the edge. She later said it felt like all nature was being annihilated. But the event produced neither her death nor the happier ending she had envisioned. She went over to gain the fame and glory, but she died at 83 years of age in Niagara Falls, New York, in a home for the destitute. So certainly she didn't gain any fame, and she didn't gain any glory. Annie Taylor was the first, but certainly not the last, to brave the falls in a barrel or other such contraption. She was followed by 15 other people who went over the falls they went over in things from rubber balls to more wooden barrels to tubes from truck tires, all held together with ropes and wires. And the next person to go over was Bobby Leach. He went over in a steel barrel, July 25th, 1911. Bobby Leach survived his stunt and he went to New Zealand and was walking down the street one day and slipped on an orange peel and he ended up in the hospital with gangrene in his leg and he died from that. So he slipped on an orange peel and died, but survived going over the Horseshoe Falls. The next daredevil at Niagara Falls would be the first not to survive. Englishman Charles Stevens was clear about his reasons for making the plunge. I want the money, he said. Stevens' preparation did not match his ambition for the perilous trip. 
Charles Stevens went over in a wooden barrel on July 11th, 1920. His barrel was not well made, and when it went over, it fell apart and took his body apart. And all they found was one of his arms still attached to a piece of the barrel. Then we have Jean Lucier, who went over in a rubber ball, steel enforced on July 4th, 1928. And he survived. Lucier was the first person to use something other than a wooden barrel or a steel drum. He spent his life savings making the rubber ball and later sold pieces of it to make money. George Stathakis is likely one of the strangest individuals to test his luck against the falls. The 46-year-old made the trip on July 5th, 1930 in a massive barrel. He took with him his pet turtle, said to be over 100 years old. Stathicus explained to reporters that should he not survive, the turtle would tell them about the experience. The turtle survived. Stathicus did not. Adopted by the Niagara Falls Museum, the turtle lived on for many years after his plunge over the falls. When you're near the edge of the falls, there is a draw. I see some people holding onto the railings because it's, it, it has that draw, the, the power of water. Most people don't give into that draw. Most people look at it and take a photograph and go back home and show it to their relatives. The odd person says, I'm going to come back and make a barrel and go over. That's an oddity. Many of the devices used by daredevils have not survived the passage of time. Several of the unique contraptions are displayed at the Daredevil Gallery at the IMAX Theatre in Niagara Falls, Ontario. The IMAX experience, we like to think of it as a real and authentic experience. It's as close as you can come to the falls without getting wet. You're not only seeing it on the screen, but you're coming out and that very tactile experience, just to be able to touch the barrel that went over the falls or to look inside and see what that person experienced as if we were plummeting over the brink. The foam barrel, you'll see where little bits of it are picked off. It's like going to the pyramids and picking up a stone. People want to take a little bit of history with them. Among the collection of barrels at the Daredevil Gallery are several that belong to the Hill family, perhaps the most famous family in Niagara Falls Daredevil history. They were known as much for their life-saving efforts at Niagara Falls as for their stunts. William Red Hill Sr. saved 28 people from drowning and recovered over 100 bodies from the dangerous waters. He was a powerful swimmer with tremendous knowledge of the river and falls. His son, Red Jr., helped out on many of the rescues and recoveries. Red Hill Sr. made three successful trips through the lower rapids, the first in 1910. During the last stunt in 1931, his barrel was caught in the vortex but his son swam out and rescued him. Red Jr. followed in his father's footsteps, starting his daredevil career in 1945 with a trip through the Whirlpool Rapids. It was an event in Niagara Falls. I was very small at the time, but I remember the whole family being there and looking over and watching the barrel go through the rapids and, and just being mesmerized by the whole magic of it. Because the falls was the forbidden. It's like the jungle. It's got that same fear factor. Six years later, to honor his father's memory, William Red Hill Jr. decided to attempt an even more dangerous stunt plunging over Niagara Falls. Red Hill Jr., he went over in truck inner tubes with wires and, and netting surrounding the tubes to hold them together and leather straps. He called his device the thing. He went over August the 5th, 1951. It fell apart and he was killed.
Red Hill Jr. was only 38 years old when he died at Niagara Falls. Another of the barrels on display is that of William Fitzgerald, who used the name Nathan Boya for his stunt. His vessel was known as the Plungosphere. Fitzgerald never articulated his reasons for doing such an outrageous stunt. He was what we call the quiet daredevil. He never made any fanfare about it. He went over, paid his fine, and then left. Since then, I've talked with Dr. Fitzgerald a number of times, and he still says, hey, I have my own reasons for doing it, and he's really never discussed it. Like any person, I am excited when I study these people, when I read about them. It is interesting, very interesting what they did. It's something I certainly would not do. Would I go over in a barrel? Not in your life. <laughs> I'd never say that the daredevils were foolish. I couldn't get in one of those devices or on one of those devices to go over the falls, so I'm not going to take that away from them. I think they're brave. I think they're foolhardy, though, because unless they really have a death wish, you have to wonder why they'd want to go over the falls. I think most of them needed to see a good psychiatrist. A flurry of daredevils took on the falls during the 1980s and 1990s. These latter-day stunters made the trip in crafts unlike the simple oak barrel that Annie Taylor rode into legend in 1901. Most were equipped with elaborate features to heighten the drama and increase their odds of survival. A few have even included hammocks, oxygen tanks, and radios. Carol Socek, the first Canadian to go over Horseshoe Falls, equipped his converted metal drum with a padded bucket seat, lights, and a radio transmitter. Each one was trying to, in some ways, outdo the previous stunters, uh, because people did get bored with certain kinds of stunts. Carol Socek went over in a steel barrel July 2nd, 1984. He survived, and later he went around and toured with a barrel similar to the one he went over in, and ended up at the Houston Astrodome a few years later, and was killed when his barrel hit the side of the tank into which it was dropped. Made it over the falls, died at the Astrodome. There is something inherently solitary about going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, the kind of thing you would do by yourself. That is, until 1989, when two natives of Niagara Falls, Ontario, created a new chapter in Daredevil history. Then we have the first duo to go over, Jeffrey Petkovich and Peter DiBernardi, two Canadians, who went over in a large, large tank, steel tank, with a periscope on it, they had music inside, and uh, they went over September 27th, 1989, and survived. For some people, Surviving a plunge over the falls was not enough. Canadian Dave Monday was the first person to go over the Horseshoe Falls twice. Once in 1985 and again in 1993. Dave Monday went over in his aluminum barrel with the Canadian flag on it, October the 5th, 1985, and he survived. David Monday came back again on uh, September 26, 1993, this time in a steel ball, a tank, so he became the first person to go over twice. Over the years, others would challenge the falls. One paddled a kayak, and another rode a jet ski. Neither survived. There's always been daredevils at Niagara Falls from a very early period. They were people who were attempting to defy death. They wanted to challenge the power of the falls. Most of these people were doing it to gain fame and fortune, to challenge the river's power and its fame, and to become equal with the falls, as famous as the falls. Their fame, of course, is fleeting. We talk about them once in a while, but most people have forgotten them. People do it for fame, 
but they don't become famous for more than two or three interviews, and then after that, they fade into the mist. Niagara Falls is the canvas on which our stories are told because it's a wonderful, dramatic river and the falls and known throughout the world. It's big. It's like Everest. It's wonderful and it's spectacular. Daredevils and stunters help to dramatize the human history at Niagara Falls. Blondin and Farini did it by walking across Niagara Gorge on ropes and wires. Annie Edson Taylor and other stunters did it by riding over the falls in barrels and other flimsy contraptions, often with fatal results. It may be that most didn't really know why they took the world's greatest and most dangerous thrill ride, but each helped to build the legend of Niagara Falls. Daredevils are part of the Niagara allure. It's something that's told over and over again. People always want to know the stories about the daredevils. When you come to Niagara, you just can't help but ask, hey, did somebody go over the falls in a barrel? Yeah, they did.